Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. We want to welcome you to our webinar on adapting open source solutions to unlock literacy for more children, hosted by All Children Reading, a Grand Challenge for Development. If you take a look at the children on your screen right now, you'll be introduced to the reason for each of us to be on this webinar today. It was uh, so Syrian refugee children like these that were part of an evaluation we conducted on an open source solution for child literacy that you're going to hear more about today. If you can think back for a moment about your very first day ever of school, or perhaps that of your children, or Perhaps the excitement that you see on children in the education programs that you work on when they're told that they'll finally have a chance to go to school. Yes, that excitement. Well, that's the space one family we spoke to was in who had to um, flee Syria just when their oldest daughter was about to start school for the first time. The mother shared with us that, I wish my children had, could get an education. My daughter is 10 now and she still can't read or write. And she shared with us, my daughter cries every time she sees other children going to school. Well, whether children are refugees like her daughter or if they're in school or out of school, we know that there's a learning crisis and that too many children are not reaching their reading milestones. All of us on the webinar today are likely working to change that and to advance child literacy. So we're glad that you've joined us um, as we learn how we can adapt um, the open source solutions to unlock literacy for even more children like those we've just talked about. My name is Michelle Utman, and I am the communications lead for the All Children Reading Grand Challenge for Development. And we welcome you to follow or contribute to the conversation about this webinar on social media by using the hashtag open source ed tech or tagging at reading BCD, our handle on Twitter, which is reading grand challenge for development. We will be recording this webinar today and then adding captioning to it and then we'll be sharing it with the group of who have registered for this webinar, as well as on our YouTube channel. We also want to remind you to make sure that you keep your mic muted so that we can all enjoy the presentation. Before we get started, I just want to give a brief introduction about All Children Reading, a grand challenge for development. This is a partnership um, that is co-founded and co-funded by USAID, World Vision, and the Australian government. And we're seeking to advance ed tech innovation and research to improve reading outcomes for marginalized children in low resource contexts. As a grand challenge for development, um, we seek to do this by mobilizing governments, companies, and foundations around important issues, and specifically to bring in new voices to solve protracted development problems, in this case around the aspect of child literacy. Since 2011, we have been doing this through sourcing new uh, solutions to address gaps and barriers to child literacy, and we've been doing this primarily through competition so far. And then we've also been testing these ideas to measure the impact that education technology might have on child literacy so that we can find out what works and what doesn't. And then once we've determined that, we're seeking to scale what works so that we can indeed improve reading outcomes for these children in low resource contexts. One of the nearly dozen competitions that we have conducted so far was called the EduApp for Syria Prize which was done in collaboration with the Norwegian government through NORAD, as well as the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, the Interagency Network for Education in Emergencies, and the mobile operator Orange. This competition, we specifically saw a source, uh, sought to source an open source um, literacy gaming app um, in Arabic. Our goal was that the game should be able to build foundational literacy skills in Arabic, as well as improve the social well-being of Syrian okay. refugee children who we could assume had likely experienced some trauma. Um, this is specifically for kids who were out of school or perhaps struggling in, in school. 
one of the things that was important to us is that the tool or the solution would be able to be adapted into other contexts. And so we required that it would be an open source solution that was um, um, submitted through the, over the course of a long period of time and through several phases of identifying semi-finalists and finalists, we finally awarded two winners or two winning apps. One was called Feed the Monster and the other was Enter and the Letters. These games are now both available for free on Google Play as well as the App Store. The game that you're going to hear more about today is Feed the Monster. This game was specifically designed for children aged five to 10 years. Players um, uh, of the game advanced from learning originally letters and sounds and then shapes into reading syllables and words, um, really by fulfilling the request of a pet monster by in fact feeding this monster. Players receive constant verbal and visual feedback on their performance. There's also letter tracing and a memory game which are used uh, to add versatility and interest in gameplay so that children keep playing, which would in fact keep advancing their skills. One of the outcomes that we learned from our research that as little as 22 hours of gameplay led to improvements in basic Arabic literacy among out-of-school uh, Syrian children. If you're interested in more of the background and the research that we did on these two games, you'll see that we conducted technical and impact evaluations on both games. The one in orange that you see is the evaluation on Feed the Monster, which we'll be talking about today. And on the far right is the game Enter and the Letters. If you don't want to read through these very um, uh, uh, comprehensive research reports on each game, we've also done a summary of the two games and the research, and those are the two reports you see on the left, one in English and one in Arabic. And here you're going to read about the great results experienced by out-of-school children like those of the mother I shared about at the beginning um, and the children that began using this app. You can find these reports on our website at allchildrenreading.org. If you go to our research menu and search for EduApp for Syria, you'll find them. Now, for those of you who regularly join our webinars, you know that we've already uh, had a webinar in detail about these games um, and our partnership with NORAD um, in this competition. So today our focus is on how others have taken these games and leveraged them to strengthen literacy outcomes um, for even more children. So today we're delighted to have as our presenter, Dr. Stephanie Gottwald, who is gonna provide a great example and insights, learnings um, related to taking an open source solution uh, like Feed the Monster and contextualizing it so that it can have broader use globally. Dr. Stephanie Gottwald is the co-founder and director of content of the EdTech nonprofit called Curious Learning. She consults with schools in the US as well as internationally on literacy development, reading disabilities, and curriculum design. She received her PhD from Tufts University and is the author of several articles on reading and dyslexia, including co-authoring the Oxford University Press volume, Tales of Literacy for the 21st Century uh, with Marianne Wolf. So welcome, Dr. Godwell. Thank you, Michelle, and uh, welcome everyone today. Um, as Michelle said, um, what I'm going to be um, talking to you about is our experience as an organization um, having taken on the task of localizing Feed the Monster. So I'll be giving an overview of our experiences, both our very positive experiences as well as things that we've learned in that process. And while I don't know that much about you as participants, you know, I can guess that many of you have very different reasons for wanting to participate in today's um, webinar. You know, it might be that you're interested in this from a technical standpoint or specifically from the localization standpoint. Um, to let everyone know that our focus at Curious Learning is really all about literacy. And so we started with literacy and it really ends with literacy, to be honest. If we could get kids reading using duct tape and bailing wire, 
that's what we would do. But we do uh, see very strong evidence for two things. The fact that technology can be an incredibly powerful tool for helping kids who are um, in uh, uh, less than ideal educational circumstances. And also that learning to read in their, the language that they speak uh, is, is, is incredibly powerful and is likely to be uh, uh, much more effective than trying to teach kids to read in a language that they're not familiar with. Um, so we took on the challenge of, of localizing Feed the Monster in some ways for, to suit our own needs, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment, but also to show that if, if you think about design and localization as a goal from the very beginning, instead of it being this overwhelming task, it actually could be, can be accomplished many times over very rapidly um, and inexpensively. So let me just, uh, you know, address some of the things that are on this current slide and tell you a little bit more about Curious Learning. Uh, so Curious Learning grew out of a research collaborative between MIT, Tufts University, and Georgia State University. And it really started with a very, very broad question. We're the first to admit that in some ways we were totally fishing. You know, is it even possible for kids to learn to read completely on their own using mobile devices? You know, there are uh, uh, somewhere between 150 and 200 million children in the world who have no access to school who will not be going to school. And in addition to probably another 600 million uh, who are going to school but are unlikely to learn. And so if we can figure out a way to make technology, regardless of whether it's a tablet or a phone, if we can figure out a way to make that an effective learning tool, then we have a very rapid way of reaching these kids. In 2014, my research partner, Tinsley Gallion and I, we founded the nonprofit Curious Learning so that we could focus on, in essence, the task of both curating open source uh, games like Feed the Monster, then localizing, and then finally, of course, the most important thing is distributing, getting in the hands of the kids, open source apps specifically for learning how to read. Um, and can I see the next slide, please, Brittany? So, yes, thank you. Uh, so what was it about Feed the Monster that was appealing to us? I mean, at the point where Feed the Monster came along, we were at the point of really debating whether or not Curious Learning needed to have, in essence, its own design studio, because quite frankly, we just were not seeing apps that were being developed that were of very high quality that we were even interested in adapting. Um, you know, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of apps on the learning on, on either the Play Store or on the App Store that are specifically for learning or learning how to read. And many of them, quite frankly, are either at a bare minimum untested, if not complete junk. They're terrible games. Uh, and then Feed the Monster came along and we saw this game that was not only but was uh, had a gameplay that was engaging, um, that was discoverable, and really focused in on a specific area of learning, i.e., you know, that first stage of transitioning from a non-reader to a beginning reader or an emergent reader, learning the letters. And I'm going to talk about discoverability a little bit more just now. Um, what we mean discoverability is we found that many, many games uh, shortchange the learning process by having some kind of a character that pops on the screen um, in order to tell the kids how to play the game. Um, we find that to be a really difficult mechanism because first of all, oftentimes those teacher-like or peer-like figures tend to use language that is much more complex than many of the kids who are learning this game uh, can understand. And we often find then that the game, if it has to be explained too much, is typically too hard for the kids to understand. An ideal game for us is one that the children, yes, at the beginning, maybe they struggle and they make some mistakes and it seems like they don't understand it, but ideally the gameplay should be one that is discover, meaning the kids can discover how to play the game. And Feed the Monster is a perfect example of that. 
We love the creatures. You know, we, we had the experience many times that we'd find a game that uh, a, game, uh, um, uh, a developer was willing to share with us and distribute all over, let's say, Sub-Saharan Africa. But then the creatures that they had chosen as the, as the main um, characters of the game were great for maybe Western Europe or the US, but were terrible uh, uh, apps for, let's say, Sub-Saharan Africa. And while the monsters are not perfect, they tend to be very culturally neutral, they're very beautifully designed, and the kids, sometimes the adults are not always keen on the idea of a monster, but the kids really seem to enjoy, you know, that it starts out as an egg and then it moves into these various beautiful monsters. Uh, and then what was even more appealing to us uh, from the perspective of trying to localize and adapt the app into many different languages is the fact that the assets, meaning the video uh, 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 assets, excuse me, the audio assets or the graphic assets were very easily interchangeable. It was very, it was a very well-defined list of assets that needed to be gathered and plugged into their appropriate places. We didn't need to make very many changes, um, which all of those things contribute to the idea that this app could be easy easily adaptable to many different languages. So we have now adapted, uh, and you notice I use the word adapted, I do not use the word translate. We are not just translating uh, any of the aspects of All right, Tiffany, I think your audio went out. We've adapted it to. Um, and um, we may or may not uh, continue to uh, adapt it to other batches of languages, but rather we've shown that in about 18 months for approximately $10,000 per adaptation, uh, we were able to crank out, in essence, 50 high quality versions of the and we're proud of that accomplishment. But we did learn a lot of things along the way as any process. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I knew that that was gonna happen. Uh, we did learn a lot along the way. Um, and um, some of the things that we learned is that um, it, is, it is accomplishable, but necessary and not always easy to recruit highly knowledgeable translators. Um, it, they don't necessarily have to be teachers. They don't necessarily, although it's ideal when they are, uh, they don't necessarily have to be scientists, um, uh, um, but they should be native speakers of the language that we're working in. We use platforms like um, Upwork or Fiverr, but we did find that depending upon the number of speakers in the world, really, and the marketability of that language, uh, that recruiting knowledgeable translators often took more time than just producing the assets themselves. Um, of course, as I said, privileged languages are easy, so it's really easy to find people who are French speakers. It's really easy to find people who are Spanish speakers or Hindu speakers, Hindi speakers. What's really hard is to find people who speak languages like Oromo or Somali or Isizulu or Sepedi. Uh, so uh, uh, languages uh, that are spoken by the kids we want to reach uh, but these languages are not often advertised as being some uh, kind of an asset on either Upwork or Fiverr. Uh, so, you know, I recommend that you then look around at your uh, uh, locality. Uh, so, in other words, I have the advantage of being very close to Boston. So the universities are filled with um, people from every country in the world. And so reaching out to international student organizations um, put me in touch uh, uh, with native speakers of quite a few of these languages. And while working over a platform like Fiverr or Upwork is great, sometimes work can happen much faster if you uh, have the opportunity to be face to face with someone. Um, and uh, we also found that if you, you know, outside of Feed the Monster, that any time that you want to reproduce a game that may have a very large number of assets, that that can be time consuming and very, very expensive. 
Um, so, you know, uh, games that have to have, um, uh, you know, lots of uh, um, audio assets recreated or any kind of graphic work. What's great is that if you can get a graphic artist that needs to, that can, uh, uh, be accustomed to the things that they need to make for this game, that only has to be slightly varied maybe for um, the, uh, the following localizations, you know, localizations two, three, four, five, and 10. Now, I will say one of the biggest things that we learned is that working in any language that does not have a Latin-based writing system, so the Roman alphabet, can be very, very difficult. We didn't know ahead of time and discovered through uh, our work with Feed the Monster that Unity, which is the uh, language in which um, Feed the Monster was developed in, does not support uh, uh, languages like Hindi, so Devangari script. Uh, so that meant that we had to have a graphic artist create all of those characters as graphic files instead of using any kind of font assets. Um, but it took us a little while to discover that problem because when you are working essentially electronically, you know, when what you see, one of the things we learned is that what you see on a spreadsheet is not always what the person that you're working with in India or Bangladesh, what they see in their spreadsheet. And that's particularly the case when you're working in something like a Devangari script. Um, so those kinds of little uh, uh, tweaks and those kinds of little variations, which are hugely important to the game, can be stumbling points that you don't discover until you start uh, embarking in working in those environments. Uh, so what is next for us um, beyond Feed the Monster? And I just uh, wanted to bring this up uh, and let the... Um, uh, everyone in the audience know this, that, you know, curious learning is working towards having, in essence, an entire suite of apps. And we've developed something that we call the app map. And uh, what the app map is really meant to embody is the whole schema of skills that children need to develop in order to be competent readers. Um, Feed the Monster is a wonderful app and it's, we're distributing it and getting it out there. Kids love it. Uh, uh, they're very successful when they play the app. Uh, but you know, knowing the uh, letters of your language um, is only the beginning of, of your reading journey. So we have a partnership uh, presently with Ubongo, which is a media production, children's media production group out of uh, Tanzania to create a series of what are called Curious Readers. These are interactive ebooks that are uh, both decodable as well as what we call engaging stories, so engaging for vocabulary and background knowledge development. Um, and those uh, stories will also, uh, over the next 18 months, uh, uh, be localized into many languages, either by us or potentially by other partners. Uh, and so we want to make sure that children have uh, access to stories, access to text that have a lot of the same features as Feed the Monster. Um, and the other thing that we are uh, working on, um, if you could go to the next slide, Brittany, uh, is, uh, is an assessment tool. So a series of games that cognitive skills as well as literacy skills. Uh, they could be used as screening tools. Uh, they could also be used as progress monitoring tools. We're developing these games in partnership with the University of California San Francisco uh, Dyslexia Center, with the University of Connecticut, and also with the MIT McGovern Institute for Brain Research. Um, and um, they uh, uh, are working towards having a set of screening and assessment tools that could be used here in the United States. Our motivation for creating these games was so that we could get a set of assessment tools that could easily be adapted um, just like Feed the Monster, to other languages. And in fact, we're working with a couple of different organizations around the world um, to have a version uh, in Nepalese, uh, as well as in um, uh, Isi Hosa in South Africa, and in West African French uh, to be used in, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, and within the next six months or so, 
And these games would be available also to be localized into another uh, a number of languages um, and would be paired in as with feed the monster with other apps uh, with the curious reader apps in order to determine whether or not the children are actually making progress um, in the games uh, and whether or not they are potentially at risk for other factors that might make it more difficult for them to to learn how to read this is would never be a diagnostic tool necessarily, uh, but would give us over populations an idea of how successful the kids are at playing the games. So those are just uh, other uh, localizable apps that we are working on for the future. Um, and you know the 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 next topic that I wanted to move to is um, what are some in essence, some guidance that I would give you if you were thinking about designing apps um, with an eye towards having them easy to localize. Um, and really talk about designing for localization is during the process of building, during the process of designing an app, you think about at the very beginning, what would be the process of converting the content of this app to another language or even just another culture, so that that process of converts easier, is faster, is less expensive. And these are some, a, a small subset of, of the most important things that we've learned in that process. You know, it may seem weird to say that I want you to take an app that's for um, learning how to read, and the first thing I would say is you should minimize the number of language elements. What I mean by that is rather than Rather than designing an app that's all encompassing, if you want to have an app that is going to be easy to localize and you want this to be easily distributed, also distributable across uh, uh, individuals who are in low resource environments, it, it's a really a good idea to focus on a particular area of reading. So in other words, the app that you're designing wouldn't take within a single app, a child from the very beginning to say second or third grade reading, but would focus in on a particular area like Feed the Monster does. Feed the Monster focuses on letter learning. And there are some advantages to that. I mean, first of all, of course, you take the number of elements that would have to be adapted to a language and you mind to just uh, 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 the fewest possible number. Um, and the other advantage for doing that is that it's, it's likely, more likely that what you are trying to adapt to another language um, is, is, is easier when it focuses on a particular area. Because remember, you are not uh, necessarily just going to be translating. You know, some of our curious reader books could just be translated. We've had that experience. Our uh, Read with Akili books are currently in both English and Swahili, and those books in general were just translated. But something like a learning letters app, for instance, or a vocabulary app even, um, it's oftentimes very difficult to just translate that, but rather you need to adapt it to the environment, um, even something like like a vocabulary app. Um, when you are teaching children basic uh, vocabulary, like house, for instance, um, you, you can't just assume that kids around the world understand that a house looks like a house as it does in Boston, Massachusetts, but rather you're going to have to change the, the, the illustrations and the environment in which that house is pictured if you expect the children to understand that the term that they use in their language to uh, label a living dwelling uh, is also this term in another language and it can be adapted to this thing that you're looking at. So, so I would argue that instead of having all-encompassing apps, you should really focus on a particular area of learning to read. Um, I, I will admit to not being, you know, a, a, a super techie, uh, but, you know, our development staff, uh, uh, has a, has a set of recommendations for how someone can optimize the de development for the changes that you have to make to the text and the assets. You know, you want to make it, if, if your app is going to be open source, if others are going to be adapting it, uh, you want to make it obvious where the new text goes in, where the new assets uh, uh, should be placed. 
the monsters and feed the monster that it's really, really important that you develop culturally non-specific characters and storylines. You know, if you're working with a particular group, like we are with Ubongo, then of course we want that audience to be able to, in Tanzania, to be able to see a character like Akili and be able to connect to that character. But if our goal, like in Feed the Monster, to have an app that can be used across hundreds of different countries, then we need to make sure that we have characters or settings that are as culturally neutral as possible. We discovered that in working with uh, uh, one app that had an owl as a main character. Seems great for Western Europe, for the US. Uh, but our partners in Sub-Saharan Africa came back with the feedback that an owl is a harbinger of death and illness in many cultures in Africa. And that's certainly not the kind of character to try to use in a game that's for children. Some other issues that I would recommend that you think about is keeping your app quite small. Many of the communities that we are trying to reach, even though smartphones are surprisingly ubiquitous, they're low-end smartphones uh, with uh, very little memory and not a lot of space. What you don't want to do is have a parent reject downloading your very valuable learning app because they don't want to get rid of the apps that are very important to their daily life. Uh, so the smaller the app is, the more likely it is to be shared amongst parents, uh, the more likely it is that they're going to download it. Um, and uh, uh, we um, are, are very, very strong advocates at Curious Learning for uh, open source apps. Um, we know that the people that we're trying to reach um, uh, are generally not people who can afford to buy an app. Um, that doesn't mean that there couldn't be some other pricing structure for other environments, uh, but uh, in an open source community, um, we are more likely to be able to reach the people who um, are in either low resource or in less than ideal, um, uh, 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 less so educational environments. And having said that, while iOS is very popular in many areas of the world, you know, Android is the way to go for those low-end smartphones. Uh, so we, we have chosen to really focus on Android, the Android operating system and Android devices um, in order to really increase global accessibility. Um, if, Brittany, you could go to the next slide. Um, one of the things I just want to spend a little bit more time talking about is the idea that you should I would advocate for designing with local localization uh, in mind from the very, very beginning. Um, you know, it's much, much easier instead of having a process in which you would design and implement and evaluate um, and then think, oh, maybe it would be great if our app was in several different languages, uh, that rather at the design stage, you basically insert a localizability review step. Um, does this app uh, uh, lend itself to being localized, uh, localizable? Of course, as I stated before, it's really important to find really knowledgeable native speakers. Um, as you're designing the app, think about the environments where you want your app to be used um, and think about the characteristics of that writing system and think about the characteristics of the language. Um, even within uh, uh, languages that use the same writing system as English, we had to make adaptations. I'll, I'll give you an example of that. Um, the way uh, that we structured Feed the Monster for English is that the children learn a subset of, of letters. Uh, so I think the first uh, letters that they learn is the vowel A and the consonants Z, C, B, T, S, and P. I, I think those are the, that's the first set. And then before they learn another set of letters, there are several levels of the game where they're playing around spelling words, spelling and reading words that can be made with just that subset of letters. Um, and that seemed to be an, uh, a structure that could be adapted to languages that have a large number of small, i.e. three letter, consonant, vowel, consonant words. And there's a lot of languages out there that have those. But of course you want those words to be words that are accessible to the children and are appropriate for a learning environment. But there are other languages, like Isti Zulu is a great example, uh, where even though they use a Roman writing system, 
they have, uh, the language itself has very, very few short words. It's called, it's what is called an agglutinative language, meaning words are made out of putting lots of different parts together. So in order for, you know, the kids to start learning some basic words in their environment, they'd be learning words that have eight, nine, 10 syllables. And that's really, really difficult for a beginning reader to master. So what we did with the Zulu app is instead of the children moving from a set of letters to a set of words, and then moving to another set of letters and a set of words, we focused on 40 or 50 of the most common syllables. So children were learning to read and spell syllables until they got to the end of the game, which is where we exposed them to words that are made out of those syllables. So, you know, that's something that you either have to do research on or a native speaker can tell you about. Um, and then, of course, I would also argue again that you should plan for incorporating new assets from the very beginning into the code base and, and ask yourself, what, what would that process be um, if uh, my app is adapted to a bunch of different languages? So if we go to the next slide, uh, basically, if we could just sum up um, at curiouslearning.org, uh, we have a guide that we worked on together with UNESCO um, and with all children, children reading uh, to uh, really outline this process of localization in a great deal more detail than I could cover in a presentation like today. So it's a very, very deep dive into the application of these principles for designing learning apps for an international set of users. I, I will say to you, we think of this as a living document. Um, so if you go to curiouslearning.org and go to resources and see the app localization guide, you will actually be brought to a, 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 a document within a Google Drive. Um, and that's not because we hold it against anybody who wants to download it and make it pretty. We consider it app open source just like everything else that we do. Uh, but we also think of this, as I said, a living document. So we make, we take into account any suggestions. So some of you might go and download or read uh, 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 that document and might have some suggestions that should be made and we invite you to make those suggestions. And oftentimes those suggestions uh, are uh, uh, incorporated into that document. So having it on a, in a Google Drive as such makes it very easy for us to make um, just ongoing changes. Um, but what I really like about this document is that it's organized around a whole series of questions for you to ask about your app. So we explain a particular section, like let's say, you know, thinking about the, how do you, how do you incorporate uh, new assets into your app? And then there's a section of the document that works almost like a worksheet. You know, basically there's a series of questions and you answer yes or no. The more yeses there are, the more likely it is that your app would kind of pass the grade, so to speak, for localization. So we, uh, uh, just to, uh, uh, to uh, 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 summarize, you know, we will be continuing at Curious Learning to work on localization, uh, to work with partners, to make sure that kids have uh, 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 a whole set, a whole collection of very high quality learning apps in their home language in order to learn how to read. Um, and, uh, and that would be for a variety of areas, but we also wanna make sure that the community sees us as a resource. You know, we've gone through this experience now, you know, approximately 50 times with, uh, uh, with Feed the Monster. We continue to work with partners to localize our assessment app and also our Curious Reader app. Um, and, and we are available to anyone in the community who is interested in doing this work, um, learning from our experiences, and, and we'd love to learn from your experiences also. Um, we really see this literacy issue as an all hands on deck uh, problem, that it's not gonna be solved just by curious learning, it's not gonna be solved just by all children reading, but if we really wanna tackle the problem of you know, preventing another billion people from being uh, illiterate adults, that we're all gonna have to come together to solve this issue. Um, and we're happy to lend our knowledge and our experience uh, to that effort. So I'm gonna stop now. Uh, I know uh, that there's another resource uh, uh, that either Michelle or Brittany would like to, to point you to. And then I'd like to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions.
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gottwald, for, for that. Um, as she mentioned, you do, you do see an, another resource on your screen, um, which I'll talk about in a second. But um, before that, I just want to re invite you to put any questions you might have for her and her presentation in the chat box. Uh, we do have a few minutes to uh, provide a bit of time for Q&A, so I'd encourage you to be putting your questions in the chat box now. Um, you, on your screen, you'll see uh, a resource that we have as well, a guide to developing digital games for literacy, and specifically in a developing country context. Um, this offers design considerations as well for early grade literacy, learning and research um, and development. It also includes 12 case studies of literacy games, including Feed the Monster and Enter in the Letters um, that you've already heard about today. And this resource I think you'll find useful whether you're developing games from scratch or discerning which features are important for uh, developing early grade uh, literacy in children. So we invite you to take a look. Um, you'll find the guidebook at, on, again, on the All Children Reading website. You see the address there. And we encourage you to also explore dozens of other research and other resources that we have on the website as well. Again, just want to remind you about the research that I referenced earlier about um, the technical and impact evaluations we conducted on each of the games, as well as the summary of that research that's available in English and Arabic. Um, you'll see a link to, um, we'll put a link to, direct link to that research in the chat box, as well as, again, if you go to our website and look under research and just type in EduApp for Syria and search for that and you'll be able to find them. I also want to invite you uh, to check out our latest blog on our website. If you go to the news section, uh, you'll see that Brittany has uh, written a blog with an interview with Dr. Gottwald, which provides even more um, details like she shared today. So if you enjoyed today's presentation, want to learn a bit more, I'd encourage you uh, to read that blog as well on our website, allchildrenreading.org. Um, finally, again, I'd also encourage you to download these games um, that we've been talking about today. Both uh, they're available in English and Arabic um, in Google Play and the App Store. Um, then you have the 50 plus languages that Curious Learning has um, adapted these games. And then, of course, the code is still available on GitHub if it's something that you want to take and use um, as well. So um, all 50 adaptions of the game can be accessed through a link that we'll also put in the chat box here, again, or by visiting Google Play or the App Store and searching for Feed the Monster or Enter and the Letter. So uh, go ahead and check those games out, download them, and, um, and see what you think. I'll, I'll now turn it over to Brittany. She's been curating some of the questions that you've been submitting. So we'll um, spend a little time uh, answering some of those before we close. All right, thanks, Michelle. So we've had several questions come in. Thank you all for submitting them. Um, we have a question here from Heidi. Uh, she says, many engaging apps for literacy so far have focused on the decoding pieces of literacy, but less so or less effectively so on the comprehension aspects. So to what extent do the open source literacy apps available on Curious Learning or elsewhere effectively address reading comprehension mm -hmm. um, strategies mm -hmm. and other factors? That's a great question. Uh, there's a couple of reasons why apps have focused more on decoding strategies when you look at languages outside of English. Um, there's some really good evidence that would seem to imply uh, in languages that are what's called transparent, meaning there's a much more clear relationship between the sounds of the language and the letters or that represent those sounds uh, um, than like, let's say for instance in English, that is a more of a, an opaque writing system. Um, there's some really good uh, research that seems to imply that if you can get kids who speak a transparent language, uh, you know, who are learning to read in a transparent language, able to uh, be efficient decoders, um, then from there on in, the strategy seems, the su successful strategy seems to be to get them to read more. So give them lots of reading material. 
I will though be the first to agree that while there is a mountain of evidence in let's say English or in German or in French on how kids learn to read, there's very, very, very little research um, on how kids learn to read in Amharic or in Isi Zulu or in Somali. Um, so what we've tried to do in moving from decoding in Feed the Monster um, into, let's say, the Curious Reader apps is take a very language-based approach in the Curious Reader apps. So they're designed around a very clear connection between the interactive elements of the of the book uh, uh, and the words that are represented. So let's say in a decodable story, the decodable story would have many, many different levels. And uh, starting with a single word all the way up to a much more complex sentence. And any interactivity on each page is connected to the meanings of the words. Uh, so the interactivity isn't just that some character jumps around, but rather that, you know, if something is representing the word big, as just an example, that that object gets bigger. If it represents something that's small, that object gets smaller. That's a key part of comprehension, uh, but it is the bridge that we're moving to um, in order to uh, uh, begin to address comprehension. But you are absolutely right that that needs to be addressed more effectively across the spectrum. Wonderful. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, we have another question about your team. Uh, so what kind of team did it require to put together the different adaptations of the app? Um, mm -hmm. They're asking, in order to adopt it to the local context, that a yeah. certain monster work for East Africa, but not for Europe, or what monsters kids like, what kind of team uh, did that require? So Feed the Monster had kind of really two stages of development. There was the first stage uh, in which the team behind Feed the Monster did an enormous amount of work uh, researching exactly these questions. So it was a team out of Israel working together with a team in Germany. And uh, they, they put in approximately a million dollars of development work. Does, you know, first of all, developing the design in which they would be answering some of, some of your questions. Um, and, um, and it was a, a team of, you know, app designers, you know, let's not neglect how important user face and engagement factors are, um, but also experts in learning and in child development. Um, and it was, so at that level, it was quite an extensive team. And we at, Feed the, uh, at Curious Learning then had the advantage of being a little bit lazy uh, to the extent that we were at that point not changing any of those major aspects of the design, but really just changing the assets within the game. Um, I will say, in my experience, uh, being the person chiefly responsible for the localization efforts, you know, across uh, communities, what I found is though sometimes we had difficulty translating the name Feed the Monster. We had a lot of discussion around that depending upon the country. Um, we typically did not have a lot of difficulty getting the kids um, engaged in the app. Uh, so I really think that the team did a really great job in the initial stage and it was quite an extensive team, um, but we were then able to benefit from that initial stage uh, of work. Um, and that's, that's where organizations like, you know, USAID, All Children Reading, um, and, and NORAD are so vital for providing that initial seed funding for doing that, that, that really crucial initial stage design work um, and that, you know, that others like ourselves could benefit from. Well, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Penelope. Um, she's asking, how much have you found that developing for iOS has increased global accessibility? Yeah, zero, like zero. So <laughs> if your audience is uh, uh, individuals who are living on, you know, two to five dollars a day, potentially, uh, then you are very unlikely to have to be to be have an audience that has an iPhone, um, it is very very likely that they have uh, 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 if if they have a smartphone, they have a low end smartphone that has an Android uh, operating system. So we have found that what is sometimes difficult is talking to funders 
apples on their personal phones and play with it and try it out, then they're disappointed that we don't have an iOS version. But our actual users have no use for an iOS version. And so we decided not uh, to, to be an iOS version. Absolutely. Uh, Penelope also asked uh, about your distribution and how you distribute your apps and what you find is mostly successful in, in that space. We, we are right now, I mean, we have a couple of different, of course, you know, the games are available on the Play Store to anybody who wants to download them, but we are working on a couple of different experiments. Um, and I can, I'll classify them in kind of two different ways. Um, one way of getting a very, very high number of, of downloads is through and, and inexpensively is through Facebook or Google ads. You know, we're working with those models right now and we're finding that uh, we get, um, uh, 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 it, it costs us less than 10 cents uh, a, a, a download um, when, we, when we run Facebook or Google ads. Um, but we find that we, we actually have a pretty high uptake rate. We find that our conversions from download, downloads to users is approximately 35%. Uh, and uh, apparently, you know, this is not really my background, but apparently it's high. Um, it's, but it involves very few touches. We just interact very little with any of our users at that point. Another way of doing it is we work together with uh, groups that we call trusted sources. Bridge Academy is an example, or you know, a local school system, or a, a, a Ministry of Education, um, and those trusted sources uh, would then work together with parents to advocate for Feed the Monster being downloaded. Or you might have field workers that have both Feed the Monster and share it on their phones, and then they can distribute uh, the app throughout a community without needing uh, uh, access to, to internet access. Um, and while that method is, um, you know, involves, of course, a lot more touch and is more expensive, it also results in a, a much, much higher percentage of users. Uh, so the version rate there is more like 75 to 80%. So, you know, three months later, 75 to 80% of the people who had downloaded the app for their kids using one of those trusted sources as a resource, um, uh, three months later, their kids were still users. So we're experimenting with a couple of different models right now and are likely to continue to use both uh, that we can get you know widespread uh, use of the app through something like Facebook or at least knowledge of the app through Facebook or Google ads uh, but that we can also get much uh, much higher rate of conversion to users by having relationships with trusted sources. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, we have another question from Tony. Uh, he's asking, uh, what extent do you provide visitors to your website or users of different Feed the Monster language versions, uh, the recommended links to supplementary uh, local language materials, for example, uh, like the Global Digital Library? That is, a, that is a great question. We're right in the process of redesigning uh, our website. So I will admit that right this moment, we don't have a link to the Global Digital Library but we, uh, or other such sources, but we are working on partnerships right now um, that will be you know, announced in the next few weeks um, in which um, our apps or any of their apps would be supportive of each other. So that would mean that you know, if somebody downloads Feed the Monster, um, we would also be pointing them towards uh, resources in their language uh, through the Global Digital Library, for instance. Or if someone downloads the Global Digital Library, then you know, Feed the Monster or a Curious Reader would be some of the games that would be highlighted um, in uh, the Global Digital Library. So we are very, very quickly moving towards uh, a much more cooperative environment in which lots of different players are working together to make uh, mother tongue resources available to kids. So that's a great question. Thank you. Another question about the use of technology and kind of mindsets and attitudes towards uh, from parents on their children using technology to learn. Uh, how have you found that the games have been perceived by people, particularly parents who are introducing, you're introducing the Feed the Monster app to? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as we travel around the world and we talk to parents, you know, parents who, uh, uh, 
you know, may have a low end smartphone are struggling with exactly the same issues as, you know, parents who have really expensive and a multitude of devices. You know, what is the appropriate diet, technology diet for my child? Um, one of the things that as many parents are, those parents are lacking is access to information. You know, what is um, a, uh, a useful app? Uh, what would be an app that would help my child learn? Um, you know, we've talked to parents in slums in India who said, look, if, if, you, if I could be told that, you know, such and such an app would help my child learn better at school, then I would let them play with it. But I don't want my child just playing candy crush for hours. These are exactly the same issues that we are dealing with in, in wealthier communities. Um, and, and it's one of the reasons why we are trying to work so closely together with groups like uh, Google, the developers of Bolo, with the Global Digital Library, so that parents don't have to do a lot of research uh, on their own in order to find effective learning games, uh, but that rather they would have, in essence, an app environment uh, that we are always evaluating, that we are collecting data on, that data with, that we can share with parents to show that these are effective tools, uh, that kids are actually learning, um, and of course, if the kids are engaging, uh, then that's even better. Uh, so, so we're finding that, you know, the, the, the issues around the technology diet for children are no different in, in, in uh, uh, poorer communities than they are in, you know, wealthier, technology-rich communities. Uh, we have just a couple more minutes. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, Maxim asks, how do you make the apps accessible to families or children who have little to no access to technology? Yes, that's a great question. So that's another reason why we work so hard to work together with trusted sources, uh, because those trusted sources are often the places where uh, children would have access to technology. So it might uh, a tablet lab at their local school if they have access to school. Or we found that also even in communities where kids don't have access to school, they might have access to some kind of community center um, where they can go and use the game. So for instance, we have a project in a small community in South Africa where uh, there's a technology lab that is uh, a part of an early childhood development uh, center there. And so uh, while the kids may not have access to technology in their homes, they have access to technology at their community center. Um, having said that though, um, you, if you don't have much experience um, being able to travel to some of these communities, I would recommend that you do so because you would be amazed at how ubiquitous uh, even low-end smartphones are. I mean, there's virtually no community that I've been to where there is no access uh, to either low-end smartphones, usually low-end smartphones, typically not tablets, but sometimes it's also tablets. Um, you know, there's still a lot of sharing involved, but it does speak to the fact that this is just a growing need for these communities. Um, that go beyond uh, 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 education, that, you know, these communities find uh, low-end smartphones are incredibly useful to them for many of the same reasons that we find them incredibly useful. Um, so the day when kids don't have access to technology is, is fleeting. For sure, absolutely. Wonderful. Well, that's all the time we have, but um, thank you so much, Stephanie. Oh, and we wanted to provide uh, her contact information. If anybody does have any follow-up questions for her, uh, yes, she's happy to you. take your questions via email. So um, that, that's available to you as well. Um, we just want to thank you, Stephanie, and we thank all of the participants or attendees who uh, visited with us today. Um, if you are interested in topics like those we've talked about today, uh, or others related to ed tech for child literacy, we encourage you to follow us on social media. Um, important note, we just launched a LinkedIn page, so we really encourage you to engage with us there for our latest resources, event invitations, and other updates. So we'll provide a link to that uh, page in the chat box as well. Um, and just a reminder that this recording will be shared uh, next, probably early next week with closed captioning for uh, available on our YouTube channel and our website. So thank you all so much for joining us. See you again soon. Thank you.
you know, 